Just exactly what every Ohio State fan wants to see. The number one next to the name. It needs to last, though. Welcome into Buckeyes Live right here at the Voice of College Football. Appreciate you being here. And, of course, we do this each and every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Steve Hellwagon, Bucknuts 247 Sports. Tony Gerdeman, it's BuckeyeHuddle.com. Buckeye Weekly is the podcast every day. And, of course, College Football Playbook right here on YouTube. Gentlemen, how are we doing today? Doing great. A lot well. to get to. All right, Steve. I guess I should correct what I said to open. Number one doesn't need to stick. One, two, three, or four needs to stick. And then it's uh, back on the uh, field for the college football playoff for the Buckeyes if they can uh, hang in those top four. Maybe it sets them up well for a close loss at Michigan to stay in the rankings, but a lot of football to be played. Yeah, no doubt about it. And I guess at this stage, it's better to be well thought of than not thought of. You know, poor Washington has beaten the top 10 team with Oregon, and they're ranked below a couple of teams, Georgia and Michigan, who haven't done anything close to that. I don't think either of them have – do either of them even have a win over a ranked opponent? I'm, no. I'm not even sure. I think Georgia's playing one this – is it this week with Missouri? Yes. So uh, they get their first crack at one this week. Uh, Michigan won't play one until – uh, November the 11th, isn't that right? So next Saturday they play Penn State on the road. They'll finally get one. So uh, those teams, we're going to find out a lot more about where what those teams have to offer when they play those better opponents in the weeks ahead. I think we already know what Ohio State's all about. Great defense, decent enough offense, cruddy special teams. <laughs> I'm 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 just joking, everybody. Parker Fleming's mom. I'm just joking, but um, you know I think that there's a lot there uh, that Ohio State has shown, and I think that uh, you know not everything is rooted in the fact that you can go out and score 45 points. It's it's more in terms of can you win in a game that that's a talent equated game. Ohio state's done that twice and nobody else really at, at this level has done that yet. So uh, to me, it's, it's a starting point and it's obviously uh, the most important thing is where you are in the poll after the big 10 championship game. If you're in the top four, then the dream lives on. If you're not, then get ready to go play in some second tier bowl game. Tony. Yeah, I mean, this was – they had the best resume, so it was just interesting to see whether they would side with the resume or their preferred opinions initially. But I think early on it's best to side with the resume and then allow everything else to catch up because George is going to start playing some ranked teams. For like three of the next four weeks, they'll finish with some ranked teams and be able to climb back to number one or whatever, wherever they need to be. But um, just – after uh, the ranking reveal last night, I went through and looked to see who the, the initial number one teams were each year, every year. And only two of the nine years has the number one ranked team not made the playoffs. So, um, you know, what's that, a 78% chance to make the playoffs based on being number one in the initial rankings? The only two who didn't were Tennessee last year and Mississippi State the first year. And that 78 coincides with what ESPN put up on the uh, screen <laughs> with their FPI and the percentage chance Ohio State has to make the playoff. And I, I take that that, you know, you never want to envision this scenario, but even if they were to lose to Michigan, there is still an outside chance based on so many other games that have to be played with these contenders with them possibly losing games, Ohio State could backdoor their way into this thing just like they did last year if some of these other top contenders take a second loss or if Florida State and Washington also lose and don't win their conference championships, then the door is wide open, I think, uh, for a one-loss Ohio State team to get back in there. Because, again, by that point of the season, Ohio State's still going to have three very good wins – with I'm counting Wisconsin, who I think is going to end up nine and three, if you know if their quarterback play holds up, uh, you know they don't really play anybody here down the stretch, so uh, they've got a chance to go nine and three. So and then Penn State, 
probably end up 10 and two. I, I don't know, even at home, I envision them beating Michigan and Notre Dame probably end up 10 and two, nine and three. I, I don't know what all, I know they have to go to Clemson and uh, they've already beaten USC. So they've done most of their heavy lifting. Yeah, I think um, the top five line up fairly well, although Steve makes a great point with Washington. I think the committee is taking into consideration Washington's recent struggles, which have been pretty mighty. And then, of course, that Oregon game, the credit should go to the winner. And then, of course, the loser has to take the hit. I think there's an evaluation of how that landed. It was basically a coin flip of a, of a game in Seattle. Uh, and that's similar yeah. to Ohio State's win over Notre Dame, although that was on the road at Notre Dame. I think Ohio State deserves some credit for that. Um, Washington plays three ranked teams the next three weeks and then plays their rival, Washington State, who's not ranked but is more than capable of beating them on a, on a perfect day. I mean, they've won some good games already this year themselves. So, um I mean, they, they don't have it easy by any stretch of the imagination here down the stretch. And uh, then, even if they do survive, probably a rematch with Oregon, who would be, uh, you know, hell-bent, obviously, to win that game. Uh, I believe it's in Las Vegas on a neutral uh, field. So, um, I mean, everybody's got their work cut out for them. Florida State may have – what do they have left? Uh, Florida and, and probably Louisville in the ACC championship. And I don't know what other tomato cans they still have to play in the uh, ACC. But, uh, yeah, it looks pretty pretty much like a cakewalk for them to get uh, um, maybe even 13-0. Virginia well, Louisville. Playing. Yeah, go ahead, Louisville and Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech and Louisville both have one loss in the ACC, and they play this week. So if Virginia Tech Imagine. somehow gets that win, yes. that would be a – I mean, it's going to be an easy devastating. road. Yeah, it's going to be a pretty easy road except for that Louisville game and the, the conference championship game. But on the, the conference call with the with Boo Corgan, the committee chair last night, he said it was the last two games for Washington, which put them fifth, basically. That was the the touchdownless – offensive touchdownless performance against Arizona State and – lackluster looking a, a game against Stanford, but they'll be able to pick it back up the next four weeks. I still think Oregon on a neutral field or even in Washington again would probably be favored over Washington the way they're playing right now. And I expect Oregon to eventually come out of the uh, the Pac-12. Although you know, I'm still not going to be shocked if, shocked if nobody comes out of there if you know with less than two losses or you know something like that. Um, it. Because Washington does have a schedule with their last four and then a conference championship game where they could still lose two of their next five games pretty easily. Yeah, you look at that Pac-12, it's different than the other conferences. And I've got to credit because I've piled on it for five or six years because it's it's been awful up until last year. But the other conferences, you can circle that game, that game, that game. There's about three games on average between the other conferences. But that Pac-12, you basically, there's about three games every week between those five teams that uh, can go either way. And there's just too many possibilities out there to really hone in on it right now. Uh, of course, a lot's going to be decided this week with a couple of those meaningful games in the Pac-12. Guys, I actually thought that the one loss placing of these teams was more telling uh, in a sense in regards to okay how what are they going to do with with Oregon mm -hmm. versus Alabama Texas and on down the line Penn State uh, drops all the way to 11 uh, just anything there that uh, jumps out or in any of the rest of the rankings well Texas is ahead of Oklahoma who Oklahoma beat them of course Texas is also ahead of Alabama who Texas defeated I don't know how you line up those three. Oklahoma has the worst loss of those three, losing to Kansas, although it was on the road and was on the last play of the game or whatever, but or near near last play of the game or final minute or whatever. That was a crazy ending to that game. We were watching it, and it just seemed to go on and on and on. We're trying to get leave to go to the stadium before the game the other night. It's like, will this game ever end, you know, so – Poor Oklahoma, though. I mean, they were having a, a really good year, and 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 
you know, it just it, these games. This is why it's so hard to go twelve and zero. I mean, we talk about parity in the Big Ten and in these major conferences. I mean, you can be having a great season and just one bad week just derails the whole thing. If Wisconsin had any kind of an offense to make Ohio State pay for the turnovers that they had in the game last week, that game could have ended up a defeat for Ohio State. But at no point, Tony, you were there, did I ever get the sense, even when Wisconsin tied it in the third quarter, that Wisconsin was ever going to win that game. Not at any moment. No, and similar to the Penn State game that I compared to the 2007 Michigan game where Michigan had no offense Chad Henney was all banged up, couldn't throw the ball. There's very little threat, and it would have taken a big play to happen, and it's something that Ohio State has not given up this year, so that led to that stuff not happening. But, Mark, to your earlier point, I'm with you in terms of the one-loss team because you you can see the committee likes the Pac-12 when you've got Oregon State at 16, Utah, UCLA, USC all in a row, 18, 19, 20, in, in there – allowing Oregon and Washington to get some quality wins. Um, and I was surprised at Alabama being where they were a little bit. But I, in terms of the the Alabama, Texas, Oklahoma thing, once you get that loss to somebody that is not in that round robin, then you're, you're out. Like if Washington loses to any of these teams, Oregon's going to jump them regardless of the head-to-head. We've seen – the, the committee gets very selective when they choose to use head-to-head, and it's, they only choose to use it when the team that won is the team that they like better. And they're like, yeah, you know, head-to-head matters. When it doesn't matter is when they believe the better team lost, and then you can point at, well, Oklahoma lost to Kansas, and that's the biggest factor in this. And that's why the committee even said that's why they were behind Texas and Alabama in this one. For anybody that doesn't do rankings, it's easy to say honor the head to head because I'm mm. I'm fully on board with that. Honor the head to head. You do you that can. when you can. That Ohio State Oregon situation from two years ago is a perfect example. I tried to do my best to honor head to head. Oregon won the game, and then even after Oregon loses, it's still a, a tie record situation to honor the head to head. But Oregon was just playing atrocious teams week after week and playing bad football, barely winning. And it creates this log jam of other worthy teams that actually should be ahead of Oregon. But if you're, you're, you're staying with that head to head exclusively, then it just becomes difficult to, to be fair to everyone else. Well, and you're holding all of those teams back because of Ohio state. And is that fair to the other teams then? Yeah. In that regard. Absolutely. So Buckeyes at number one and, uh, we can move on to anything else with Wisconsin. Of course, Travion Henderson was uh, key in this one, and I'm going to start to give uh, the guy a little bit more credit than I have in mm-hmm. the past because he's churning out 150-yard games against really good defenses, regardless of how it's done. And this one, to me, was a little bit more impressive. It was a little bit more of a slow burn. He did have the big touchdown play late, but still – uh, more effective and more consistent from play to play. Yeah, no Mark, I'm with you. It's the consistency that it, that was the key for me. And he had he had several explosive plays, but it, it wasn't the defining factor in his yardage total like it was against Notre Dame, where he had 104 yards rushing and half of it comes on one carry. He had 162 yards rushing and was getting positive yards almost all the time. And then you throw in three or four 20, 25 yarders and a 33 yarder in there. Like I thought this was his best game maybe ever. And, you know, probably since the Tulsa game where he went for 277 yards as a true freshman, but that was against Tulsa. Now I will also say that Wisconsin has given up some rushing yards this year. So some of this may be fool's gold, but it's still good to see when you're just, you're looking for a glint of something. And I think they, they found that and it helps everybody's confidence. And and I think it forces the defense to take a uh, the opposing defenses to take a harder look at Ohio State's running game, which could then open up some more with the passing game. Yeah, this was so so much needed at the time that they got it. I mean, when you think about it, that uh, you know we find out in hindsight that uh, that uh, 
Mayan Williams is now out for the year. So they're down a guy there in the backfield. And uh, Henderson uh, had 162 yards. The Buckeyes rushed for 181. Chip Trianum had a few, uh, you know, some, there were four sacks that deducted probably 15 or 20 yards off of that total as well. And um, so Wisconsin was only given up, I think, about 90 yards a game rushing. They have a really rugged uh, stellar defense, kind of the same thing that Ohio State's going to see this week with Rutgers. I think Rutgers and Wisconsin are almost mirror images of one another. Um, Great defenses uh, try to run the ball primarily. Uh, You know, the quarterback, Gavin Wimsett, has played all season, but – uh, you know, he's about as good of a thrower probably as this backup was for Wisconsin. I think this guy uh, could be pretty good for Wisconsin if he can, you know, l- learn the change up maybe a little bit. His fastball was a little bit too much at times for his guys, and uh, he's got to be able to to go with the off-speed pitch, you know, at some point, you know, to keep the hitter off balance. But, uh, um, you know, this running game for Ohio State was – just what the doctor ordered at the right time. And they've got to find a way to keep Travion Henderson healthy because he is the key, as we saw in this game, uh, or a key to uh, to getting this team to where they want to be. The running game's what's been missing, you know, in many regards, you know, to barely scrape together 80, 90 yards rushing every week with this Trayonum Williams tandem that they've trotted out there isn't going to get it done when it comes down to to money, money ball time. And so, you know, and I look at Michigan, if Henderson's able to go for like 75 or 80 yards against Michigan, you know, and they're able to get like 120 total, that that's really important. I mean, that that's better than 60 or 70 that they probably would have without him. So to me, I think, um, that is uh, that. That's just so big, you know. It's it it's hidden yards that you just don't factor and think about. And we can talk about McCord until you know the the cows come home with everything that's not going right there, and then how great he played, you know, after the the first quarter and a half or whatever. But um, it just makes life so much easier when you're able to get five yards on first down. We talk about it every week and they haven't been doing it in recent weeks. And the offense is kind of, you know, cough, cough, you know, whatever. And and this week, you know, he was able to run the ball and they were able to have a comfortable uh, get ahead comfortably there late in the game. He has to have second and third options. And with that wide receiver room, it's inconceivable to think whether it's that nobody is stepping up to replace Emeka Buga, or whether he is just so locked in on Marvin Harrison because of the obvious, he's the best in the country. And number two, they've got a long history together that, that he can't spread it around a little bit more. And another guy can't be, you know, Robin to uh, Marv Harrison's Batman. I think last week that Robin was Travion Henderson with the passing game. But you know, at, at some at one point last week he was down. Kyle McCord was down, missing a Mecca Abuka for the game. Then Julian Fleming left, so you're down to Marvin Harrison and some backups. And obviously the confidence there is with Marvin Harrison. And you look at what what's happened in the last couple of weeks where he's put the ball right on the hands of both Julian Fleming and Xavier Johnson, and the ball bounces off of their hands or off of their faces. And so there, there may be some concern there, just the lack of trust or more uh, clearly more trust in Marvin. But I'm with you. You need to spread it around more. They did dial some stuff up for Cade Stover, but that got shut down. Um, you know, Emeka Buka should be back this week. Ryan Day said he could have gone last week, but I don't know what situation is different now other than it's just a, a, a week later. So they may get him back, which will obviously help everybody. I think they've they've got some good things out of Xavier Johnson with the running game. I think they should continue that even when Emeka comes back. But you can't you can't make it so like when you put him in, that's when he's going to get the ball because then that becomes obvious. But I think they will continue to do stuff like that with Emeka as well, provided the ankle will allow it. But yeah, he, he's got to. You can't just focus on Marvin because that's when 
a cornerback in a cover three can drop off of a, a guy and know that the pass is going to Marvin and intercept it like the second interception that McCord threw last week. Uh, I, I saw, I think maybe Sue talking about they need to get the second half of Kyle McCord playing like the first half or playing that way in the first half. And just looking at his numbers, in the first half of games, he's completing 59.7% of his passes with nine touchdowns, three interceptions. In the second half, he's completing 70.7% of his passes, five touchdowns, no interceptions. Um, I do think it's interesting looking at his red zone stats. He's 14 of 37 passing this year, so 37.8% completion in the red zone, nine touchdowns, one interception. But um, I'm, I'm, Ryan today has talked about it in the past, wanting to get started quickly and trying to figure out a way to get the second half kind of accord playing in the first quarter, and they haven't figured it out yet. So speaking of McCord, I know that Steve said, you know, it is what it is, and uh, this is who he is. But, uh, you know, for several weeks there, it looked like you could check something off in regards to improvement. There was pocket presence. There was checking downs too soon. There were certain things that it was like, OK, all right, he's he's learning a little bit. He's getting his scolding on the sidelines. I'm sure he's getting it at practice and he's improving in certain areas. I don't know that I I'm really at the point where. Uh, I, I know against Purdue, I thought he was making more it more trust with his receivers, m- making more confident NFL kind of throws. Uh, maybe the last couple weeks, I haven't necessarily seen where he's continuing to elevate. Yeah, it's a tough, tough discussion. And I'm sure it's one that uh, Ryan Day and his coaching staff are having uh, behind closed doors. And they kind of come to the fork of the road with this with this guy McCord. And I, on one hand, you know, he left the game, his left ankle foot was in a boot and uh, something happened perhaps on that play where he scrambled and slid. Somebody said that maybe a defender rolled up on him on that play or what you sometimes see with the field turf is the, the foot will sometimes grab on those slides and you'll injure yourself, you know, trying to avoid an injury. So, um, I'm not sure what it was, but, um, you know, he's a little banged up and that's not going to help. Obviously, uh, I'm sure he's getting round the clock treatment, uh, whatever it is that the sports medicine people think is best uh, to, to get him feeling good about himself and his ankle. But that doesn't help the cause. Um, they're kind of at the fork of the road with him. I mean, he's he's either got to pick it up and make the plays that are there when they're available to him, or they're just going to have to accept that he's all they've really got this year, get through this season, however it ends, 11 and, you know, 2, 11, 12 and 1, 15 and 0, wherever it goes, just kind of accept that that's, that's, that's what you ended up with this year. And the very real possibility, he gets Beckman. And, you know, that's what happened to Todd Beckman after 2007. They had a hotshot freshman, Terrell Pryor, come in. And once they lost to USC in the manner that they did, it was kind of all bets are off at that point. We're going to go in a new direction. And um, he's got to be much more consistent if he expects to maintain this job over the long haul. Because, you know, Air Noland is coming. Devin Brown's going to be a year older and better. Lincoln Keenholtz is, you know, supposedly something. So, you know, looking long term, you know, it's murky for this guy. And he's got to play better. There's just no two ways about it. He can't eight games into this on first down and goal at the eight-yard line, roll to his right, have all day to throw the ball, and then throw it into triple coverage and have it intercepted in the end zone. That's seven points they left on the field. You can't do that. They had to kick a chip shot field goal. You know, there's four more points they left on the field. Every week they leave double digit points on the field. That's why that's why they asked people on the show last night, is Ohio State the best team in the country? And the resounding answer was no, they're not. But they have the best resume. So they put them number one. You can't leave 11 points on the field every freaking week and expect 
to beat Michigan, Georgia, Florida State, Washington, anybody who's any good. So there you go. I do think it's interesting, and Steve is correct about these throws, and I gave you the red zone stats, completing less than 38% of his passes in the red zone, and yet Cal McCord is still ahead of Jordan Travis, Drake May, Shador Sanders, and pass efficiency nationally. And, and it's that's that's maybe the most frustrating aspect of it, I think, for people is because you see what is there and you don't see it all the time. And it's it's the ups and it's down, the downs, the highs and the lows that that frustrate some people because you know the throws that he can make, but that that first interception is one that you, you've got to throw away because there was nothing there initially. I think that was one of the ones that was drawn up for the tight end initially, and that was blown up right away. So. Just get rid of it, and that's something that – that this is a mistake that you want to have happen in, in this game rather than Michigan or a Big Ten championship game or the playoffs. So learn that one, check it, check that box now, and don't make that mistake again and just throw it away because I think that was first down. And Yeah, first and goal at the eight. You, you can't do that. Like and, and, and he knows that, and yet he still did it. So I think that's another area of concern, of frustration – but again, like most sixty percent of the time, he works every time, as they would say. I'm not defending the throw, but he's banking on Carnell Tate's going to make a miraculous catch at the pylon, <laughs> or he's banking that hardly any DB is going to make the kind of catch that uh, Zachman made. But he had Marvin Harrison back in the corner, and it would have been about a five percent chance of happening. But if he lofts that thing toward the back pylon and throws it basically out of bounds, then maybe that was the option. If he tried to make any kind of play happen there, obviously he should have most likely thrown the ball out of bounds. Live to throw another day. Yes, especially in first down, as you guys know. Absolutely. We talk Buckeyes here every Wednesday, 11 a.m. Eastern time, but it's important to please subscribe, hit the bell for the notifications to know when we go live based on scheduling. We sometimes have to move the show, but typically Wednesday, 11 a.m. Eastern time, Steve Hellwagon, Bucknuts 247 Sports, Tony Gerdeman, Buckeye Huddle, Buckeye Weekly is the podcast. Tony, what do you have working this week? Um, you know, now with the uh, in terms of the podcast, we did our instant reaction of the college football playoff rankings last night. It went about an hour and a half, answering a bunch of um, viewer questions. There's probably some talk about Connor Stallions and the gigantic Michigan sign stealing scandal that is sweeping the nation that everybody is talking about. So there's probably some stuff there as well. If you wanted to check that out, you can find that at YouTube.com/slash Buckeye Huddle or any of your podcast platforms of choice. Just search Buckeye Weekly. Steve, before we came on live, you were running down your day for me, and my response was, it sounds like one of my days. Yeah. <laughs> WTVN at 8.30, dentist at 9, live show here with you fine folks at 11, I have lunch with a buddy at 12.30, basketball interviews at 2.15, Canton Radio at 4, football interviews at 6.30, and then taping a segment with Spectrum in Ohio at 7.30. So, and then at 8.30, I'm going to come home and collapse. So that's the uh, that's where I'm at. Folks, uh, join us on our Discord, 24-7, 365 College Football Talk. You also get my predictions, and you get uh, Steve Merrill's Under the Radar Selection, 17-5 against the spread since the beginning of last year. It's exclusive to us at the Voice of College Football. Get the YouTube channel membership right here. Well, actually, on the main channel, I forget always where I'm at. On the main channel, you get the YouTube membership or Patreon backslash Mark Rogers TV. Lorenzo Styles is being redshirted, correct? Yeah, that's the plan. That's what they're trying to do so that he can get a year of working at corner and then be in the mix to get some playing time next year. So he's got one or two games left to play this year. Mayan Williams out. I'm guessing that that wasn't one play that was that's been a slow burn of he injured his knee and he's been trying to deal with it trying to work through it right and they probably just decided hey it's just not happening this year we got to get him under the knife 
well, Steve, he hasn't looked like the same guy he was last year. So I'm thinking no. this has been an ongoing thing. Yeah. I mean, 24 carries for like 60 yards last week. I mean, you know, I know um, whoever it was they played last week. Penn State. Penn State. Penn State. How, how soon they forget. Penn State's pretty good, but uh, he just didn't have the burst. And uh, he left the game. It was really weird. Trianum played the first quarter. I think, as we all saw, he blew that pass protection thing. Tony Alford freaked out and put – Mayan Williams in the game. Then Mayan had basically every carry in the middle two periods, like 24 carries between the two middle periods. And then at the end of the third quarter, something may or may not have happened because Trey Onham came back in. Finally, after two quarters of, you know, stewing on the bench about his one missed assignment, he uh, got back in the game and uh, finished the game. And, and nobody really thought anything of it until we get the report this past Saturday that Mayan Williams is out. And there was, you know, no update until about 20 minutes into Coach Day's comments yesterday. One of the reporters said, is there an update on Mayan? And he, and Day kind of said, oh, yeah, Mayan's out for the year. You know, kind of buried the lead. Now, granted, his impact on this team has been relatively negligible. He's had a couple of goal line touchdowns and, you know, made a couple plays here and there, caught a pass or two here or there. But, um, you know, he's been not really not much better than the number three back all season long. And um, so, uh, you know, what does this mean for Dallin Hayden? If something happens to Henderson, I think you almost have to play Hayden at that point because you'd be down to just Trey Onham and Evan Pryor. And Pryor, you know, doesn't feel like they have any confidence in him to play against anybody who's any good. So maybe we see some of him the next couple of weeks. He's already redshirted there. So they're not holding him out to redshirt him again. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. It It's uh, you hope that the depth situation doesn't come back to bite him again this year, like it did last year. I mean, they, the season in a lot of ways hinges on whatever's wrong with Travion Henderson. And, and uh, to me, and we didn't really ever get a clarification after the game, he said he had a cheap shot that he took from a Notre Dame defender. People on Twitter have tried to pinpoint it that maybe he took a helmet to the ribs when he was already on the ground, and maybe this was a rib injury that kept him out for three weeks, which is plausible because it's hard to even get out of a chair when you've got a got a rib injury, let alone try and go out and play a game of football. So that can be very, very painful. So um, – I don't know if, if we've clarified exactly what that injury was. He's had foot problems in the past, but I, I, you know, I don't know what it was. But as I joked, they need to put him in bubble wrap and ship him to Piscataway, New Jersey, and then put him in bubble wrap and ship him back to Columbus, Ohio, and just go from there. They only allow him to travel in a knocker ball. Suit. That's right. Yeah, one of those big, big balls that they use at the stadium. Uh, yeah, I, we had heard, we had heard – ribs and then when you saw a clip of the the shot to um the the, the late hit against Notre Dame and then he makes played sense. through that but yeah that makes sense there and I'm with you it's a lot of this offense depends on him being out there to make things consistent and I I'm still not convinced they're going to turn to Dallin Hayden and burn that red shirt yet I think they're going to try to get through this with Travion and Chip Trainum and Xavier Johnson and Evan Pryor and go with those guys it's rare to need a third running back, as we've talked about Mayan Williams, who has been that third running back and his lack of impact this year. Like You can get away without having that third running back as long as you don't have injuries, but they've had injuries. So I think they will, barring anything, you know, struggles or anything like that, or if they're just not getting anything from Chip Trainum, then you probably have to turn to Dallin Hayden. But for as little as they've played him, and they're still trying to preserve that red shirt, I'll, I'm, I'm going to assume that they're still going to do what they can to make him a redshirt sophomore last year, next year, and try to get through this year with what they have. And and they still have depth. I mean, Evan Pryor is apparently a legit, legitimate guy, but he can't sniff the field. And, and Xavier Johnson, they really like what he brings, and he can do several different things, and he creates conflict with the defense. So I think they like that aspect of having him out there anyway because 
it, it, he allows them to go from 11 personnel to 21 personnel, or if you've got two tight ends, he can, you know, he can be a second back or um, he can do some different things just to cause some conflicts. He can be a blocker. He can be a runner. He can be a receiver. So they like that aspect of it. And so we may see the same thing we saw at the end of last year where he is everywhere. You you may end up seeing that again, moving forward. I'm not suggesting not to be strategic with these red shirts and to plan and so forth, but are most of these guys going to be around long enough for it to matter who redshirted and who didn't? That's the thing. And at Ohio State, should you be reliant upon a a fifth year guy as one of your skill position players? That means he's not been good enough to leave for the NFL. And you want to have guys that are playing for you and handling the ball who are good enough to leave for the NFL after three years, let alone four years, and certainly not five years. So that to me, it, while he's a very good player, it's like, how good would he is he actually if he's still there as a fifth year guy? That's my thought. Talking Buckeyes with all of you each and every Wednesday. Lock it in right here at the Voice of College Football. Uh, we've got a Florida State show at 6, Miami at 7. Join us for those on those channels. There was a question there about Mayan Williams, whether he would come back or not. Coach Day said that nothing's really been discussed because this is all so new, the injury. He could come back for a fifth year next year. Uh, I think he was a freshman in 2020, which was the COVID year. So um, mm -hmm. he would be able to come back certainly next year if he wants. And I, you know, I think at this point, I think he has to decide if, if it's worth it, uh, you know, what, you know, he re wouldn't really have, he'd be a free agent and probably an undrafted free agent if he left to declare declared for the NFL and, uh, you know, would have to try and latch on somewhere. Um, so maybe in that regard, it'd be worth it to come back and try and try and have cobble together some kind of a season next year. But, you know, can he get healthy enough to do it? He just, he's, he plays two games. He's out three he plays two games. He's out one, you know, it just, it just never works out for him. You know, you say a free agent and my mind immediately went to the portal, not the NFL, because he could be a free agent in college football next year if he wanted to. And I've never always been a policy of mine not to speculate about transfers but it's the game now. That's just part of the game, and I'm not saying he's going to transfer. I'm just saying that is going to be an option available to him, uh, and you know we'll, we'll see what Travion Henderson decides to do because if he heads to the NFL and has a strong season and leaves early, then that kind of opens things up, but um, still plenty of decisions to be made for Mayan Williams. And the really interesting thing would have been if he had made this decision after playing just four games because that 2020 season doesn't count. So he would have still had a red shirt available, but he played too many games this year. And I think Trey Onum will probably be back next year. And um, Hayden, most likely, I would think, would be back. So mm -hmm. there'll be competition, even if he does come back. And, uh, you know, kind of a tough spot for him. David Greenshield, the two of us. Yes, Dallin Hayden. That's That's our guy. All right. Doesn't look like it's going to happen unless they're forced to. Sue is asking about uh, what has happened to Joe, Joe Royer this year uh, and, and the uh, competition with G. Scott back up. Yeah, he's he's been banged up a little bit here and there. And he and G. Scott and Joe Royer were kind of battling for that backup spot, that number two guy uh, early in, uh, in camp. But I think that that was – it's been won by G Scott and he's been out there a lot this season. And Brian day was asked about it on Tuesday about the situation behind, like who is the number three tight end? And he said, we've just got a lot of youth there and they need to really get that depth going because they do have some questions there and they have some concerns. And Sam Hart, who is now a red shirt sophomore has maybe only played a handful of snaps. Joe Royer, dealt with family tragedy last year, injuries throughout his career as a fourth-year guy. Bennett Christian can't play this year because of uh, the, the suspension. And Jelani Thurman, a true freshman, is just a true freshman, and this is a developmental position, and it's really rare for a true freshman to make any kind of impact, even though he lost his black stripe pretty early. 
But, um, you know, he's a guy that could factor in next year. But right now they've got two guys and that's about it. And they've, they've, you know, we saw last year they would play with two guys and then have Mitch Rossi as a, as a tight end, as a fullback. That's kind of gone to uh, Mayan Williams or Chip Traynham at times being that second, second running back like Rossi could be last year. So they're thin at that position and they're, you just have to, devise the offense around what you have and they're still playing a heck of a lot of 12 personnel both tight ends on the field at the same time and that kind of tires them out but they can also give each guy a rest in terms of g scott and kate stover when they go to just the 11 personnel with one tight end which they've done there'll be times out there where it's g scott in there instead of kate stover to give kate stover a rest Folks, if you're in the uh, New York City area you want to go to the football game or any game or any NFL game that matter. We've got to deal with uh, thinksmarter.com. You can download the app or just go to thinksmarter.com. Our promo code is BIG or BIG20. So BIG gets you $10 off. BIG20, $20, $20 off with a purchase of at least $300 in tickets. We've had people that have accessed that and it's worked out well for them. So give it a shot. Best uh, platform on the secondary ticket market well they do have a ball game coming up this saturday against rutgers so i guess the scarlet knights aren't necessarily a joke but reaching bowl eligibility before november and i don't know if you guys are like me but i've got this pecking order when it comes to any conference in terms of these are the teams those are the second tier team on down the line and it takes a little time for those to i'm probably a little bit uh slow to move on that and it looks like rutgers has taken maryland's place as uh the the team that uh could be just not not pushing the top three but uh kind of settled into their own little category there because they have dragged around the likes of uh indiana and others uh winning those kind of football games so they're at six and two yeah they're having a great year this is the best season rutgers has had back to uh 2014 I think that might be there if with one more win at some point if they can get one more win they would have their first winning season since 2014 I think they won eight maybe eight games in their first year in the Big Ten with Kyle Flood was their coach and um, they are six and two right now um they are going to go to a bowl game, although they did go to a bowl game two years ago when they only had five wins as a replacement, I think, for another team. So they're going to earn a bowl. This will be the first bowl game that they've earned in a long time. So that's that's tremendous uh, for Greg Schiano. It's been a slow build in his first uh, you know, few years back. I think it was – three wins, five wins, four wins, something like that the last three years for them. And now to get to six is uh, very impressive. So I think you got to be, uh, if you're a Rutgers fan, you got to be optimistic. And uh, they played Michigan tough uh, for the first half. It was seven to seven late in the first half. Michigan scored a touchdown right before halftime to make it 14 to seven. And then Mike Sainer still, uh, their outstanding defensive back had a long pick six return for a touchdown and the floodgates opened and the line on that game was like 22, 23 points and Michigan won like right on the line, 31, seven. It was, might've been a push. I don't even know, but it was crazy how them guys know exactly how that thing's going to end, uh, you know, six days before it's played. But uh, are you talking about Michigan? Yeah. The Michigan game. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, in Michigan, it's crazy how they know what you're what you're gonna what you're gonna run. I know that uh, at halftime of that game, Shiano said, "There's some weird things going on out here," you know, whatever that was. He said, and his thinly veiled, uh, you know, the the whole thing in this coaching profession is, I'm gonna walk right up that line. I'm gonna accuse you of cheating without accusing you of cheating, because then I am not part of the fraternity if I accuse you of cheating. I'm ready. I'm ready and willing and waiting for one of these guys to just step up and step out of that box and just clearly say what everybody knows at some point. So, you know, I guess we'll wait till hell freezes over to have that day happen. But, uh, you know, we, we've been cheated upon. But I'm not going to say by who, you know. 
All know. the Big Ten coaches should get together and write out their script yeah. for their halftime talk with the sideline <laughs> reporter and just, just share that. And that's going to be the script for every week and kind of prove a point. But uh, yeah, uh, Rutgers threw together a five for 12 out of Gavin Wimstad for an astonishing 39 yards passing against Indiana. But when you're rolling up 276 on the ground, I guess you don't need to. There are far too many teams, I guess, in the Big Ten for anyone that's wants to see a passing game that's running up these kind of numbers each week. There's like a collection of them uh, more so than any other conference. But, Tony, it's working. Yeah, and if you look at the national leaders in defense, you'll see some Big Ten teams up there, and it's more because they're playing a bunch of Big Ten offenses and building up these ridiculous numbers because they're they're facing no threats in their conference schedule. I will say congrats to Rutgers for winning six games in eight tries. They're 0-2 against the two teams they've played that are above 500. they They're you know, 6-0 against everybody else, 5-0 at home. So, you know, Ohio State's got their work cut out for them, but – it will be interesting to see uh, you're talking, comparing them to Maryland and how we, we all just view Maryland as better. But, you know, Rutgers beat Northwestern. Maryland didn't. Uh, Maryland will come to town to end the season. I'll be interested to see how that one goes because I don't see Rutgers winning another game before then because they've got Ohio State. Then they're at Iowa. Then they're at Penn State. I think I think a seven and five is a lot better than six and six just for, um you know, not just the the optics of it, but also beating that Maryland team that people view as ahead of you and uh, just establishing uh, some presence there. And, you know, good job by Greg Schiano. But there are schedules in the Big Ten where you should be able to win seven games. This is one of them. And uh, and they're doing what they should be with the schedule. So, um, you know, good job on having uh, playing in a very weak schedule or weak conference right now, I guess I would say, to this point. Guys, I'm going to have to uh, beg my uh, goodbye here. I've got an appointment at 1230 I need to get to in, in downtown, so it's going to take me about a half hour to get there. But I look for a carbon copy of what we just saw. Uh, I'll probably pick it like 34, 13, something like that. I think the offense will take one more step, add one more touchdown to the pile this week. Uh, Rutgers defense is very good particularly against the pass. So McCord, you know, he's getting ready for these challenges playing against, you know, another stingy defense. And these are good preparations, I think, for him. I don't think we can dismiss the fact that he's going against good teams, that he's at least struggling against good teams, I suppose. If it would be different if he was struggling against, you know, some some awful defense. But, uh, you know, to my way of thinking, these these are all – Steps in the progression. I don't want to make it seem like it's all doom or gloom with him because I mean, he, then he comes back and makes amazing throws like the the touchdown over the top to Marvin, and Marvin again makes the play that only he can make. I mean, like two guys in the entire nation could make that play, and he's one of them, where he catches the ball with the guy draped all over him and somehow still gets a foot down in bounds and comes down with the football. I mean, and amazingly, this week it, it didn't move like that so they couldn't wipe it out that was what coach day said after the game it didn't move you know so which these had two touchdowns wiped out because on replay got a foot down in bounds but because it went like that they you know you know it wasn't like he was juggling it you know this yes this is not a disqualifier this is a disqualifier (laughs) somebody's got it some odds on the bolitnikoff award maybe that we don't know about that could oh, be well. an issue. I'm going to run. All I'll right, see Steve. You guys next week. Sounds good. See you, Steve. Tony, we've not checked in on the offensive line this week, and that's that's a that's a mandatory uh, for us to do that. So, it, your thoughts about their performance against Wisconsin? Yeah, I, they had some really good moments uh, with the run blocking, but Travion Henderson helps that and makes them. It gets to the hole quicker than the other guys. It gets through the hole quicker than the other guys. Uh, struggling in pass pro I, that that's been happening but they're they've not been perfect yet in anything and so you can look if you want to look and see if they're struggling in the running game you'll find snaps and if you want to look and see that they're doing well in the, the pass blocking you'll find snaps there it's just a lack of uh, consistency right now which is the concern in terms of it just takes one bad thing like ryan day had a 
was talking about, I think it was the second snap of the game where there was, I don't know, a negative play or something, but it was a low snap from Carson Hinsman. Kyle McCord had to look down to get the ball, missed the fact that there was a blitz, so he didn't see who the hot guy was, and just and they had it blocked. If, if McCord would have thrown it into the flats for, with a hot read, they had blockers out there, and it would have been an explosive play. But just a simple thing because of the low snap, he missed being able to see the blitzer. And so with so many plays, it's just one thing, like not getting to the second level for a blocker to to hit a linebacker or a snap or one bad step or choosing the wrong blitzer, the wrong guy to block when you, maybe you don't follow the rules that have been assigned. So just things like that, um, you know, that has been what has set this offensive line back. Talent overall is, you know, I'm sure they would like to have more talent, but they're. I, I'm feeling much better about Josh Simmons now than earlier in the season. He still gets his customary false start, but he's. he's I think he's doing really, really well at this point. Is getting better each week. Josh Fryer at right tackle has had some issues. The interior Carson Hisman has some ups and downs. Sometimes more downs than ups, but I think you expect that from a redshirt freshman starting at center when you're facing a bunch of defenses with the, you know, the amount of different defensive fronts and things that you see in college is more than what you see in the NFL because of different systems, different teams, different skill sets, different recruiting bases. So I think it's a lot to process for a young guy and this is only going to make him better, but he needs to get better now rather than waiting until next year. Never before has there been uh, so widely known the, uh, number one player in the nation in penalties. I, I think that graphic comes up every week at some point on the broadcast about uh, Josh Simmons. Uh, Christopher Foote here apparently only watches preseason NFL games. I don't remember CJ Stroud being especially very good. So Christopher is the unique fan out there who only watches NFL preseason games, apparently. Well, I mean, if you want to tell people that you, you don't that that you're either blinded by bias or don't know football. This is the statement to use because I I don't even need to go into why. I think everybody understands why. Yeah, I shouldn't have uh, gone there, but uh, it just amused me. All right, everyone, catch uh, Tony each and every day on his Buckeye Weekly podcast, and uh, I'm sure there was a lot about the number one ranking, the Michigan scandal, mm -hmm. the injuries, mm -hmm. the matchup mm -hmm. against Rutgers, all of that, of course, <clears throat> with uh, Tony and also in BuckeyeHuddle.com. And uh, Tony, appreciate you always being here. Have a great Thank rest you, Mark. of the week. And uh, when do you travel out? We're going to we're gonna hit the road uh, around uh, dawn Friday morning, head out to Rutgers and uh, get there Friday uh, late afternoon for some sort of a, a dinner type of thing and what other shenanigans we can find. Okay. Shenanigans are always good. And I believe the weather is supposed to be a little bit better mm -hmm. than it's been or looks to be right now. I woke up to snow and I didn't expect that. I, I'm not much of a weather guy that reads Ford casts or has any idea what's going on with the weather. It just kind of hits me and then I'm shocked. Oh, it's, it's actually November. So it's going to be colder. I got to find my jacket kind of thing. All right, Tony, appreciate you being here. We'll see everybody back here next uh, Wednesday.